My church has been going over Sermon on the Mount lately, and I always like to compare Sermon on the Mount to Romans 7. I'll show you what I mean. Starting at Matthew 5:17, quote, Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law, until everything is accomplished. End quote. And after he says that, Jesus goes through teachings on several different topics of morality, and he structures these by saying, you've heard it said, and then he quotes from the law, and then he says, but I say, and then he gives his instruction. Very first example, Matthew 5, 21, quote, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court, and anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell, end quote. And he goes through several topics in this same way, not only holding the listeners accountable to the law, but saying that we're guilty even if we do something a fraction out of line with the spirit of the law. Another example, 527, quote, You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So you don't have to actually touch someone else to commit adultery, it's even thinking about it. And the phrase, in his heart, is important there because it's not about the action, it's about the intention. And this really is what separates Christianity from Judaism. You might say, on a surface level, but it does go deeper than that. Judaism is about following the law, keeping the covenant with God. The covenant with Abraham, covenant with Noah, covenant with Moses. Well, Christianity, on the other hand, is about doing what you know to be right. It's about looking for and clinging to that love that God has been trying to teach humanity all along to recognize. And that's not just me saying it either. John spells out the theory behind this stuff in Romans chapter 7. Starting at verse 1, quote, Do you know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, the law has authority over someone as long as that person lives. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she's called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work within us, so that we bore fruit for death. But now by dying to what once bound us, we've been released from the law, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. End quote. So this is saying that when we follow a written law, but when our hearts aren't in it, we're just doing it out of fear of punishment, fear of the social consequences, maybe doing it out of social obligation. I've seen videos online of Orthodox Jewish people trying to find loopholes to get around the no work on Sunday thing, and some of the groups have a rule that you cannot make a cup of coffee. I don't know what technicality this falls under. I know different groups have a rule that you can't open the refrigerator because the you, you'd be completing the circuit that turns on the light in the refrigerator. So by completing that circuit, it's technically building something, creating something, so by their law that follows under the definition of work. So what they do is the night before the Sabbath, they unscrew the light bulb so they can open the fridge without completing that circuit. But back to the coffee, I've seen people try to find loopholes by putting the coffee grounds in the cup and then pouring the hot water over it, and they say this follows the law. But if you were paying attention to Sermon on the Mount, no, it does not. Sermon on the Mount is all about getting rid of those loopholes and doing what the intention of the law was. That law from the Ten Commandments was keep the Sabbath holy. The intention was to have an entire day set aside just for God, community, family, and to not get distracted by other things on that day. The intention was not to stop ourselves from making coffee in the morning. And the people who worry about building a circuit or pouring hot water, they're getting too worried about the technicalities and not focusing enough on love. And Jesus himself showed us a wonderful example that follows along exactly with the keeping the Sabbath rule, actually. He healed somebody on a Sunday and the traditional religious scholars got on his case about doing work on a Sunday. But work in and of itself was not the point of the law. Jesus was showing God's love when he healed that person. And given the situation, given the circumstances, that is more important. Just like direct example that Jesus gave, if you have a pet or a farm animal that gets stuck in a ditch but it's a Sunday, well you don't just make the animal wait overnight, you get the animal out of the ditch. Now at my church we actually did have a whole Sunday school discussion around this. And to drive the point home, the group activity at the end of this discussion was coming up with 
more everyday examples of specific situations where following the new covenant, the agreement we have with God, the one where if we believe in love and Jesus Christ, we are forgiven of our sins, and in turn we have an obligation to show God's love to others. Examples when following that covenant would require us to do something different than following the old covenant. And when all the groups came together and shared what we came up with, there was a good bit of overlap in our answers. Most popular one was, you probably all know the ethical dilemma, if the Nazis come to your house and ask, are there any Jews here? Well, of course you lie about that. Because in this case, showing love, preventing that murder, is more important than anything the law says about lying. Now, I've heard second or third hand that some Jewish groups actually rank the laws by importance, so if one law ever conflicts with another, in this case it might be a law against murder, even if it's indirect murder, conflicting with the law against lying. Some people would flesh that out with that ranked priority list of laws. But I say that's not only a big headache, but it's not what God intended. The law of Moses is not meant to be a legal document. It's meant to be guidelines to hopefully teach us how to show love to one another. And that love should be the thing that guides us. Reading more from Romans 7, verse 7, quote, What shall we say, then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, You shall not covet. So, lying, bearing false witness, is obviously bad, and the fact that it's in the Ten Commandments forces us to examine why it's bad and understand it. But just like seemingly breaking the Sabbath by healing on a Sunday, love is what's more important there. The example some people gave was, if you had a time machine, would you go back and kill Hitler? You would be preventing a lot, a lot of deaths. So would it be the right thing to do to prevent those deaths by causing one death directly? Sort of like the trolley scenario. And in talking about that one, we actually learned about, I forget the name of this guy, but there was a priest in Germany at the time who really, really struggled with that do not kill commandment because he saw everything that was going on in his country and ultimately he decided to participate in one of the assassination attempts against Hitler. He was caught, he was imprisoned, and at least according to what I heard secondhand from the other people in that Sunday school group, he was executed by the Nazis less than a month before the war's end. So obviously in some cases there's an argument to be made that even murder under some circumstances could be the loving thing to do. Another example that comes up, honoring parents who ask you to do dishonorable things. I've actually heard third-hand about people who grow up in a Satanist family and the struggles they have trying to get away from that, but it doesn't have to be Satanism. It can be just parents who are in a bad lifestyle. Parents who drink, parents who are split up from their partner and they sleep around all the time. Maybe they're involved in crime. That's not a good environment for a kid, and it can be very confusing growing up in that, and it takes a lot of strength to grow up, realize that it's wrong, and decide that your life is going to be different from that because as soon as you start standing up and trying to make your life different, you get pushback from your old life, and that might include your parents. I certainly hope the situation is as easy as it can be for anyone who's going through something like that. Another example that came up, if it's Sunday morning and you're on your way to church, and you see someone's car broken down on the side of the road, that person is having a really stressful time, and helping them out is more important than doing your morning prayer. And something someone else brought up, this is an interesting one to think about. It might be appropriate to get a divorce if you have an abusive spouse. If your spouse hits you or hits the kids, then separating yourself or the kids from that situation is most likely the loving thing to do. And the reason I say it's interesting is because a while before this I heard someone else talking about divorce, saying that the exceptions are adultery and abandonment. So if a spouse completely abandons the family and runs away, then it would be biblically acceptable to get that divorce. But in explaining that, that person gave abuse as a form of abandonment. Not abandoning in the physical sense, but abandonment abandoning the love that you're supposed to have for your family. Now, obviously abuse is bad, I'm just not sure I would classify abuse as abandonment. I think I prefer classifying this under the Romans 7 exception to the law example. And then one last example, this one's kind of fun. Earlier I read the passage from Matthew about, you shall not murder, you shall not even call someone a fool, or otherwise you're murdering them in your heart. Continuing on from that passage, Matthew 5.23, quote, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift." End quote. So not even just if you're mad at someone else, if someone else is mad at you. This is literally telling you that if you're on church on a Sunday, you're supposed to exit the building, go and find that person, and make things right with them before you drop something in the offering plate. So reconciliation between two people, Jesus says, is more important than attending church. I hope you enjoyed going through this with me, and if you can think of any more examples, drop them in the comments. God God bless and have a good day.